Mexico. Welcome software engineers to day two of CSC 222. It's good to see you. I need to actually see myself for just a second to see if I am, yeah, looks like the focus is a little better today. Uh, that's good. I think we can uh, dispense with that huge view. Told you last time what a fun class this was. This is Dilbert again. The person with the pointy hair there, that's the boss. I hired a humor consultant to teach us how to have more fun at work. Dilbert, does he cancel out the consultant you hired to filter our internet access to entertainment? Wally, that was a funny comment. How'd you do that without a consultant? <laughs> Thanks for laughing. As I mentioned last time, there is a text. The text is broken down chapters by week and you'll find it online at Blackboard. If you haven't connected to Blackboard yet, and you know I can tell that, most of you have, the vast majority, 90% plus of you have. If you haven't connected to Blackboard yet, be sure to do so. And I'm gonna ask you to read the text. We don't have time to cover everything in discussion, my note outline for each day kind of pulls out what the important parts are. It's sort of the outline of the chapter for that week. So be sure to read through it. There's even some pictures and very interesting facts to be sure. <laughs> Last time I said there may be quizzes, that was a lie. There will be quizzes. Each Monday, typically, at least for the first part of the class, few, few, <laughs> For the first few weeks, months, or years of the class, on Monday, there'll be a quiz, and that will be over the previous week's reading. Not deep, not tricky, very straightforward. Number of the things I will have touched on in class even, so you've heard it several different times. The quiz will be on Blackboard, and it'll be opened up. You can take it um, pretty much any time on Monday. I'll say more about that later, and I'll remind you of that on Monday when I can actually show you one in Blackboard after it's been released. Last time I mentioned Assignment Zero, and hopefully you can see Assignment Zero online at Blackboard. And thanks for the comment last time that said the dates were off. When I went to look, for some reason, half of the dates were 2020 and the other half were 2024. And it took me a little while. I think I've got things in 2022 now. Um, I'll look manually and make sure. Regardless, assignment zero is due Monday. Next Monday, that's August 29th. And uh, typically when things are due on a day, what I mean by that is before class begins. I'll grant a little bit of grace, uh, depending. I call this add numbers. Uh, we're going to see this in its various stages and incarnations. And it comes from, uh, oh, you know, I checked the course cast video from last time in a couple of different spots, but I forgot to check to see if you could hear Dr. Patrick T. Ferry, president of Concordia University, Wisconsin, giving me this assignment. If you couldn't, he basically said there's a member of the board. They need a Windows app that will add numbers, needs it by the middle of next week. Well, I'll try to get, I couldn't get much more information. We'll make some, we'll talk about that a little bit and see where we can go with it. Now, let me say this now, and then I'll show it to you later. What are you going to submit on Blackboard to me for assignment zero? I wanna see two files, two things. The first of all is the C sharp code. That's in a file identified as .cs. There are a couple of them. So I'll show you a little later. We'll actually go there live and take a look and find the correct .cs file. And a second file, the .exe. If you understand Windows, you know a .exe is an executable file. It contains machine language that can natively run. Now, there's a little trick. Blackboard will not allow you to upload an EXE file directly. You probably know why that is. If not, I'll tell you later. 
So before you can upload that file, you're going to have to rename it, rename its extension from .exe to .pgm. There's a lot of logistical things to do in assignment zero. And that's what I'm trying to get across along with a program to add numbers, All right? First time I shared that with you, we'll take a look at it again uh, just before we zip off to the lab to do some more Visual Studio programming today. Now, if you have a Windows-based machine, uh, you're pretty much all set. Uh, go search for a visual, Microsoft Visual Studio. You want to download the Community Edition. Notice it's free for students and individuals. That's what you want. Unfortunately, what I'm showing you is Studio 2019, the previous incarnation. And that's because that's what we have on the machines here at Concordia, Wisconsin. But you'll be able to figure out very similar. Got a Windows machine, download Studio Community, install it, takes a while. The download and install takes a while. And then you're set. Now, what if you have a Mac? Well, you need two things before you can download Visual Studio. The first thing you need is a virtual machine. Now, you can read all about virtual machines. Let me go to this one site. Let me share this site with you so you can at least see the link to the site. This is Macworld. If you just search for virtual software for Mac, you'll find this little article. No need to read the uh, advertisements, right? They're going to talk about a number of different ones. But interspersed between the ads and other things, you'll understand a little bit of what a virtual machine is. A virtual machine is a software layer that sits on top of one environment, one operating system, and allows you to run a different environment, like a different operating system, on top of it. I'm using Parallels at my university. The university supplies Parallels to faculty and students for free because they have an agreement. Um, I don't know. I sent a note to ITS there at Irvine, and I know they're really busy at the beginning, so I haven't heard back if you've got this available or not. But if not, there are some free versions of it. And one of those is VirtualBox. Let's switch back and let's take a look at VirtualBox for a second. So first thing you need to get on your Mac is a virtual machine. Oracle, the company produces something called VirtualBox. And you notice that they have a platform for OS X. <laughs> Who said OS X? It's OS 10, sorry. Um, and yeah, people were before, what if I got an M1 processor? What if I have an Intel processor? It doesn't matter, it's okay. If you happen to have an Intel processor, you could do something different. You can use Apple's product bootcamp, but everybody can do this. So download VirtualBox, takes a while. Install it, takes a while. Configure it, takes a while. But look, there's lots of documentation here. I'll just go to the site. Let me switch over there so you can uh, grab the URL if needed. I'm at, guess what, virtualbox.org. And there you'll find that. So the first thing you need is you need a virtual machine. Now this only applies if you got a Mac. You got a Windows-based machine, you don't have to do any of this stuff. All right, once you have your virtual machine set and set up, what do you have to do next? Well, next you have to get Windows on your machine. Windows is a licensed product. You need a license key to do it. Now, if you go directly to the Microsoft site, I mean, their low-end versions of Windows are $100 plus. Well, there are some alternatives. On my campus at MechWan, uh, our IT department can provide students with a license key because we're set up as a Microsoft vendor. If, our, if the IT department at Irvine is not set up for that, 
And I'll, if they are, I'll post that for you later. Uh, I've got a message in to them. One thing you can do is you can just download Windows from the Microsoft site. By the way, if you can still download 10, I do 10 rather than 11, but up to you. You can download it and you can run it there if it and it will not be activated. I think you saw that on my machine last time. Although, no thanks. Although I do have a fully licensed version activation key, it has to connect back to MechWan's server every so often. So you can do that and not act. The, the problem with not activating is you can't configure Windows. And there's some other weird things. And there's some other things, and there's even a way to get a license key fairly inexpensively in this article here from tomshardware.com. <laughs> yes, it's you, no. No, let's not do that. All right. If you have a Mac and you get stuck, there's two things I'm going to tell you. First of all, you need to complete the assignment by Monday. So use Irvine's lab. Go into the lab, log in, Windows is running, run Visual Studio and do this. In the meantime, work on these other aspects. If you run into a problem, connect maybe with somebody else in the class or ask the IT service, what, what do you call it, Irvine? IT services maybe uh, at Irvine. I bet somebody there can help you. If worse comes to worse, send me a message. I'll try to help you also. Now, if you run a Linux-based machine, you know what you're in for and you're totally on your own. <laughs> I've got an Arduino. Well, too bad. Boss, you don't appear to be working. I am working. I'm designing a network upgrade in my head. All I ask is you don't look like you're enjoying it. <laughs> okay, uh, you're gonna be Dilbert eyes by the time we're done here. Last time we took a little look uh, at the beginning of unit one. There are three academic units in CSC 222. They revolve around these three concepts, idea, implementation, interaction. You can read a little bit about it now. We'll talk more about it later. Don't worry too much about it now. But this first unit is all about the idea of software engineering. Roman numeral zero, uh, an overview. What I'm trying to do is give you some insights from some other people and other authors. Last time I shared with you and read more about it in the text, from uh, Macmillan, Macmillan Encyclopedia of Computer Science. So let's take a look at software engineering through the lens of Ralston and Riley, the authors of Encyclopedia of Computer Science. What you're gonna find, and you'll see this more clearly when you read the text, is they're both really saying conceptually the same thing. We said this last time, uh, when we reviewed Macmillan. In the beginning, and the beginning of software engineering is the mid 20th century. Little history lesson. First true computer, 1946, ENIAC. Programmed by women changing wires in plug boards. By the time the 1950s come along, we have a little bit of what might seem to be to us programming. And certainly by the 1960s, we do. And by the 1960s, there's been enough programming that folks realized there was a problem. Why? In the very beginning, program was considered an art form. Very few people could do it. Very few people did it. And whatever they did was just for them, just for their organization, and very specific to one specific machine. Programming was an art form. Ah, that thought leads to an issue. And that issue is something we called last time. Oh, okay, I guess I have to tell you. Software development was and is plagued by products that were three characteristics 
of software developed in the 20th century and still software developed today in the third decade of the 21st century. Software development is plagued by products that are over budget. They cost too much. Behind schedule, they were late and full of bugs. They didn't work at all. They didn't work correctly. I call these three aspects of software the unholy trinity. Cost too much to develop it. Development takes too long, much longer than we thought and planned for. And we're all done. It doesn't do what we wanted it to do. Ugh, that's a problem. That was recognized as a problem in the mid 20th century. And that's why software engineering was developed as a discipline, as an idea, as a thing. Software engineering is a response to a crisis. Why are we doing this? Because people didn't know how to develop software. They thought it was art. They can do whatever they want to. Oh, do you have a, you must have that chain. What is it that has the easy button instead of the panic button? That's some, Never mind. Never mind. Software engineering is a response to a crisis. By the way, is it really a crisis? If you search online, you, I, I think I mentioned last time, you're going to hear some pundits say there's no such thing as a software crisis. Well, that's baloney. There is a software crisis. What's the worldwide cost of IT failure? How could anybody figure this out? Well, um, this, this is a couple of years old, but you know, it's just two years old. Three trillion dollars. And uh, the author says, these are the most reasonable numbers I've seen. You can see numbers online in the tens of trillions, and you can see numbers online in the millions. I think those are both wrong. A couple trillion, a couple trillion dollars. Yeah. Do we need software engineering? Absolutely, we do. Now, this is something to keep in mind, something that is extremely interesting. What is the definition of software? Every legitimate definition of software, if you ask somebody, what is software? Well, if you ask a coder what software, a coder would say code. But if you ask a software engineer, the software engineer would say code plus documentation. All standard definitions of software include not only code, but also documentation. What do we mean by documentation? Well, yeah, we mean comments in the code and other things, professional programming practice. But we also mean documentation that describes the product and the process and the product. And we'll be seeing that as we go along. So don't be misled. Software is not just code. Software is code and documentation. Important idea. You looked up Chuck Norris? You did, good. Chuck Norris can delete the recycle bin. <laughs> You're a Mac user, you have no idea what this is. See, Mac is an environmentally unfriendly system. They have a trash can. The more environmentally friendly Microsoft has a recycle bin. I'm kidding. Neither one of them are environmentally friendly. Uh, but when the Mac uh, GUI first came out, it had a trash can, made perfect sense. Windows couldn't copy it, of course. So they have a recycle bin. Delete. Okay, your turn. This is a quiz. No, not really. Some of you know about Chuck Norris and some of you don't. That's okay. That's okay. Don't read other people's answers if you can help it. Would you go to chat and answer this question? It's a well-known Chuck Norris thing. How many push-ups can Chuck Norris do? Would you just go to chat and answer that? 
I've already seen a correct answer. Some other really good ones, by the way. I need everybody to answer. If you don't know, you could say, I don't know, but guess. That's fun. We're getting there. We're getting there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay, a couple of people, okay. These are, whoa, these are pretty good. Some of you know the actual correct answer, and some of you know it because you said something that was so close. Yes, yeah. When Chuck, they, the corollary is when Chuck does a push up, he's not pushing himself up, he's pushing the earth down. Yeah, the answer is yes. I like that. Good. All right. Um, the answer, of course, is all of them. Very good. Folks, um, would you do me a favor? And, and don't bother doing that this time. I should have put this on a slide. Maybe I'll try to send everybody an email message. When you connect to Zoom, would you have your first and last name as your identifying name? I have several groups of people that have the same first name in class. And uh, it's hard for me to distinguish between them that way. You don't have to change it right now, but the next time, if you don't mind for this class, I'm kind of surprised because um, Zoom at Mequon, when, when students go through the link, then it records who they are, you know? So you can have whatever you want as a screen name, but just the report I get shows their actual name and it doesn't do that here. So that's helpful, thank you. You got it all. By the way, I don't think there'll be anything about Chuck Norris on the uh, quizzes. I'm pretty sure there won't. What's the goal of software engineering? Again, according to Ralston and Riley, believe it or not, it's the same goal we saw last time in Macmillan. A couple of different words. The goal is consistent products which meet requirements. Now, another way of saying that is products which are acceptable. Consistent products which meet requirements. We'll be spending a number of days talking about the idea of requirements. We'll see that. Ralston and Riley added some, so what's that mean? First of all, they say it means the software is correct. That's good. Secondly, it means it's usable. That's something, you know, as coders, we don't think about a lot. Once we hack that stuff out and it compiles, we go, whoop, we're done. Uh, that's software engineers. Not only does it have to be correct, it also has to be usable, which we'll define and discover later. And on time. Now, as students, we know a little bit about this. I mean, there's a deadline, right? Does Professor Tallman, does he yell at you if you're late? Nah, he's too nice a guy. I'll yell at you. Okay. But why is there a time constraint? Because in industry, there's always a time constraint. You're producing a product for somebody or you're producing a product for market. There's a time constraint. I, I don't want to spend a lot of time talking about this. So again, please read about this in the first, the week one readings of your text online at Blackboard. But this class is software engineering. If you know some things about engineering in general, that will give you insight into software engineering. Similar process, but in many cases, a very different product. So you can ask yourself this question, what is engineering? Read a little bit of my answer in the text. But even more important is to think about this question. What's the difference between science and engineering? Your program is called computer science. And I believe there is science in computer science. This course is software engineering, and it's definitely about engineering. So what are the differences? When you read the text, you'll see a couple key terms. 
creating and building. Why does a scientist create? Why does an engineer build? And that will help you see the difference. If we had more time and didn't have to go into the lab today, we could talk about automotive engineering. I apologize, but most of my analogies and examples and illustrations come from cars. Can't help it. You think of something different that works. Engineering? Okay. Did you finish writing the software? No. I spent the last three days setting up my programming environment. So you've done nothing? Nothing you'd understand. What makes this a little more meaningful for us is whether you're running Windows, Mac, or something else, if you want to do the assignments in this class, and by the way, there'll be a number of assignments, and they're all going to be done in Visual Studio for Windows. So you got to get that environment set up. And interestingly, all the time you invest in doing that is preliminary to doing the actual task of assignment zero. But I know it, I know it's there. And any good software engineering manager would know that's part of the job also. Getting all your tools set up, configured, in place, accessible. Yeah, that's important in software engineering. So finally, what is software? And Roman numeral zero was overview, one was engineering, that went really fast. What about software engineering? We'll be talking about it throughout the course, but we got to begin somewhere. So let's begin now. Here is my concise, tiny definition of software engineering. Software engineering is the management of the entire software development process. Oops. Folks, I apologize. I use a number of standard to me abbreviations. And if you are on the Mequon campus, you know what these are. S slash W is my abbreviation for software. There's no reason I couldn't spell it out because I don't type anything in. I, I speak it in, but it just does that. Soft SW, software engineering is the management of the entire software development process. We'll be talking a lot about management, but don't think of it as some kind of business class that you're a supervisor. It's not quite that. Why do we do software engineering? What's the goal? Well, the, all goals in computer science are to solve a problem. We solve a problem by producing an acceptable and usable product. We solve a user's problem by producing an acceptable and usable product. Acceptable to whom? The user. The user. Don't worry. We'll see all this again. A um, couple of important points that I'm going to just run through pretty quickly. First of all, there's a, there's a big difference between an academic environment, what we're in right now, and a production environment. By production, I mean you're working in the software industry. I worked for the California Department of Transportation, and I worked for Hewlett Packard Company in five divisions across three states in my not-so-illustrious career. There's a difference. There's a lot of things that we cannot emulate in the production environment. We, we don't have enough time. Real products are developed by huge teams of people over months, perhaps years. We're just gonna simulate that. In this class, we're gonna do one ongoing individual project and one ongoing team project. Right now, many of you are frightened. You say, I hate teams. I've worked in teams before. Teams are awful ugly. I'm the only one that does things. Other people don't. I know, I know. When you work in industry, you will work in teams. And the difference is in industry, a non-team player is 
fired. We don't do that in the university. Well, we got to do it. Another important thing to keep in mind, coding. What you've been doing so much in other computer science courses or even on your own for fun and good for you. Coding is a small portion, a small percentage of software engineering. Depending upon who you read, it's about 20%. That means that there's a whole lot of other stuff that goes on in software engineering. Don't get me wrong, coding is vital. It's important. As a software engineer, you have to be an excellent coder. But there's lots of other things to do too. Oh boy. How do I know I did it right? How do I know that I have a successful project? What is my boss, my manager, my supervisor, how is she going to rate me and evaluate me? A successful project in software engineering is one that produces an acceptable product following a defined process. You had a good project if you end up with a good product and you had a good process. We'll define the terms later. What I'm saying is it's not subjective. And it's not just the software engineer that determines success. The software engineer can follow the defined process, but the acceptable product is the user telling us. Have I said this a couple of times before? Yeah. Software engineering is the solution to the software crisis. You won't believe this. There are companies today <clears throat> that don't do good software engineering. They, they don't have a good defined process. And guess what? They end up producing garbage. There are many companies that do have a good defined process, but when they go throughout their process, then something comes up like they're behind schedule and uh, whatever, and they jump away from it. Uh, not good. <clears throat> Heard a couple of puns from me last time. It won't be the last time, though. And you know that baby puns are childish. But great puns are full grown. Full grown. I have to be, I have to be my own laugh track. Okay. All right. We'll, we'll just move on. Yep. Good. Oh, thank you. <clears throat> so let's define software engineering. I know we did a little bit. Let's do a little bit more. Management, that's a key word. And there's a lot of aspects of management. It's basically managing yourself, managing technology, and sometimes managing other people. Management of self, management of the entire software development process. Now, what can we say about the software engineer? Little panel from an old Dobert. My vast array of personal technology makes me dominant over the less equipped engineers. <laughs> People used to wear like cell phones on their belt, calculators, whatever. All right. Software engineers, <clears throat> excuse me. This is what we think software engineers do. They develop new software. Remember, not just coding, but they develop, they create new things. The next generation Halo, nobody plays Halo, whatever game you play. The next generation of iTunes no longer exists. Well, anyway, whatever it might be, the next latest and greatest thing. As it turns out, most software engineers maintain existing software. More software engineers maintain current software than develop new software. Apple has more engineers 
maintaining current incarnations of Mac OS and iOS and their apps than they have working on the next gen stuff. By the way, maintaining existing software can mean two things. Number one, enhance it, update it, add a new feature. Hey, it's Rev2 of this wonderful thing. And the other aspect of maintaining existing software, fix bugs, right? Last time I shared with you, the president of Concordia University, Wisconsin, Dr. Pat Ferry, his vision for the university. And I just bring this up because I internalize this and I've woven it throughout the class. So when you see issues of truth, beauty, goodness, and community, and wonder where do you get those ideas? Well, Dr. Ferry didn't dream them up either. These are the so-called transcendentals of philosophy, truth, beauty, goodness, and community. So those are gonna pop up from time to time. Just realize it's just how I'm structuring the class. I think I shared this one with you last time, Paul writing to the church at Philippi, thinking about these things, true, beautiful, good. It's one of the few selfies we have of the apostle Paul I always thought he was taller. Did you make the software changes I suggested? <clears throat> no, because I reflexively disagree with every suggestion that anyone ever makes. You're very reasonable. No, I'm a total... Wait, what did you just do there? <laughs> One job of software engineers is to manage, sometimes other people. We're going to be talking about the software development life cycle, abbreviated SDLC, likely every time we meet. And if I don't mention it, you should think about it. Software development life cycle, what is it? It's a way to manage the project by monitoring its progress at various stages from conception to retirement. Why were you thinking of me when I said retirement? <laughs> the software development life cycle is a way to manage the project by monitoring its progress at various stages from conception to retirement. In other words, it's a structure or another typical term is framework. It's a structure or a framework. It's the process. It's how to do software engineering the software development life cycle. I said, it's a way to manage, by mon how do you monitor progress? The idea is one of milestones. A milestone is a way to mark progress. In ancient days, they actually had a stone that they carved like in England here, and that's Ireland. You don't even know how to pronounce those things. How many kilometers to whatever town it is? Today, if you drive down the freeway, if you're driving down I-405 or I-10 or I-5, there are mile signs and exits, right? It's exit 343 or whatever it might be. And then it's exit 355. So those are marking the progress as you drive. We have milestones in software engineering to mark progress. It's a way to monitor and manage the project. All right, what is it? There are six steps, stages, or phases in the software development life cycle. Let me just list them all right now. Don't have to know anything about them right now. First phase or stage or thing in software development life cycle is requirements. The second phase, specifications. Those are different. Third phase, design. Fourth phase, 
This is one of my favorite words, instantiation. <laughs> Just means make it, do it. For us, it means code it. Here's the coding. Ah, let's code it. But notice there are three phases that come before coding. And after you have instantiated it, oops. I'm going to change that. I was thinking before the semester began, I want to use a different word, and I do. And that word is deployment. So ignore that. And then maintenance. It's okay. We'll talk about it again. I better make a note to myself, right? Note to self. Hey, no, don't start with that. We'll see these six phases in depth as we move throughout this course. One thing software engineers should think about, why are they doing this? Now, if your goal in life is to graduate, get a job and make as much money as you can, I probably can't blame you because when I was an undergraduate, that was my goal too. But actually, and as you get older, and I didn't have to get that much older, there, there, there are other things. Whatever you do, Paul tells the church at Colossae, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men. Knowing that from the Lord you receive the inheritance as your reward, you are serving the Lord Christ. One thing that happens often in the workaday world is we don't get praised enough. You don't get thanked enough. Heck, that happens in the academic world. Did I say thank you today? Thank you for coming today. We don't, well, it's not going to happen. But Christians, we work not for other people. We are serving them, of course, but ultimately work heartily as if working for the Lord. One more time, what's the goal of software engineering? Create an acceptable and usable computer system. Now, software engineers, we think about software, but a computer system has hardware, software, and people. That people is not only us as developers, but our users. So we're oftentimes constrained by the hardware platform. You got a Mac, Here's, that's it. But we do have control over both software and people. Acceptable to whom? To the user. That's the goal of software engineering. <clears throat> Did I do Zeb last time? I think I did, right? Uh, can I look for this right now? Uh, so my friend Zeb is looking for work. He's going door to door. Knock, knock, knock. He knocks on the door. Da, 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 da. And comes to one house. Lady answers the door and she feels sorry for Zeb. She says, okay, I've been after my husband to paint the porch for, for months now. Can you paint the porch? Husband said, I can do that. I can do that. Cool. She says, go around back to the garage. You'll find paint and paint brushes. Come back when you're done and I'll pay you for what it's worth. So about 90 minutes later, Zeb comes back, knocks on the door. Lady comes out. She's looking around. The porch isn't painted. Zeb says, all done, lady. And oh, by the way, Tell your husband he has a Lamborghini, not a porch. L Lamborghini, not a porch. <laughs> okay, folks, beginning next time. Oh, I got the CUW mission statement in there. And it says CSC 370. Now I got to change all that. Beginning next time, you're going to see some assignments that say CNCS for Christianity and Computer Science, where I'm going to ask you to think about, and we'll discuss it too, I'm going to ask you to think about a connection, a relationship between the commandments and software engineering. Hmm. Why? Concordia University, Irvine is a Lutheran Christian university. 
I don't have their mission statement memorized, but when you read through it, you'll find that they're, they want to develop folks who are great role models and understand a Christian worldview. Realizing that not everybody who goes to Irvine is a Christian, and I know that, but it's part of the mission to develop a Christian worldview. In just a minute, I'm going to jump into uh, Windows and I'm going to um, show you some things in Visual Studio. This is the code we created last time. If you haven't created this code, I'm going to encourage you, go to Visual Studio, do, follow through what we did last time. If you don't remember all of it, either look on one of those sheets or look at the end of the video from last time and just do this. Make sure you can do this much. It will give you some insight, mainly because you might make a mistake or two and then um, figuring that out will be very helpful. By the way, in this class, we are going to think deeply about code comments. This is an art form to be sure, but there's some science behind comments. The first time I'll say this in class is this, a good comment explains why. No reason to say what you're doing. Comments are in code. If you're looking at comments, you can read code. There's no reason to say I'm adding num1 plus num2. I know that. Tell me why you're, that's a good comment. A good comment explains why. We'll see that throughout. All right, now, the fifth stage in software engineering is actually deployment rather than execution. And in assignment zero, I'm gonna ask you to deploy your code by uploading it to Blackboard. And then I will download it, execute it, and see how you did. We're gonna be talking about software deployment a little bit, but heavily in unit three of this class. Now, how do you do that? Well, I'm gonna capture it here and I think we'll have time and I can show you when we're actually in the Windows environment after we go through adding some more code. What you need to do, first of all, is you need to find, it, it may be in something like this, your username, source, repos, and then, under a folder that is the name that you gave the project. Remember up front, we gave the project a name. When you open that folder, you'll find two things. The SLN solution file, this is what you double click to start Visual Studio. And then another folder with the same name. In that is all of the stuff that you need. If I double click and point at that, I have a bin file for binaries an object file, a properties file. And then here, see this stuff here? Form1.cs. Form1.cs, that's your code. That's your C-sharp code. You can verify that if you open that in a text editor, you'll see the code. Notice there's some other things with CS like designer.cs and program.cs. Eh, form1, that's what you want. Now, what about that executable? Well, then you open up the bin, double click on bin. Under that folder will be a folder called debug. Open up debug. And under debug, you're gonna find an executable file. This is what you're going to rename, don't copy it to your desktop, rename it.pgm, and then upload that. Don't rename it right here. That is your actual code. Now, one tricky thing, if you're not used to Windows, be sure that in your folder that's looking at this under the view tab, you turn on file name extensions. Otherwise, you won't see that exe. You won't see, you can tell it's the right one. It says application here, but be sure that in Windows, under the view tab of that window, you select file name extensions. Otherwise, you may not see the .cs, you may not see the .exe, et cetera. Now, 
Once you have that file, copy it from there, put it on your desktop, rename it, rename the extension from exe to pgm. Why are we, oops, why are we doing that? Because Blackboard will not allow you to upload an exe. Does it make sense? EXEs are executables. It could be malicious code. That'd be bad. So we just, we're, we're fooling Blackboard. We're just telling it, oh, it's not an EXE, it's a PGM. <laughs> you rename it, upload it. I'm going to download it, rename it EXE, and then run it. There's a lot going on here. You got questions, you'll ask. So, we're going to go off to the lab. Did you stand up? It's okay. You can stand up. Oh, darn. Wait a minute. Hey, you. Hey. Oh, there it goes. <laughs> um, bum, 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 bum. Do I get, oh, I said you could stand up. Okay, take 45 seconds and stand up. If I stand up and walk away, then I'm invisible. Oh, there I go, I disappeared. I'll still talk to you though. How's that? Put my hand in there, there we go. 30 more seconds, keep standing. Fifteen more seconds. Keep standing. If you want to keep standing, you may, obviously. There are important health benefits to standing, right? I should have looked this up. I, at Irvine, I know that there are, we call them health and human performance courses. In the bad old days, they were called physical education. Uh, we have a core requirement that undergraduates have to take two HHP courses, one general about health and wellness and the other an activity elective. And I'm sure you have something similar and you've learned about all the benefits of movement. Bad just to sit in one place for an hour and 15 minutes. All right, let's go off into the lab. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch to my Windows virtual machine. I have a virtual machine, Parallels, installed here that runs on top of the Mac OS. Within Parallels, I have installed the Windows operating system. So now I'm able to do any Windows, well, yeah, pretty much anything that Windows can do. Now, because there is a virtual machine layer, if it's helpful, think about this as an emulator. It's not going to be as fast as if it was running native on the hardware. And my machine is kind of old and cranky and whatever. So mine is not really quick either. But here we go. Once you have Visual Studio installed, <clears throat> I would then suggest that you run it. So you could do that in a number of ways, right? Uh, if you're not familiar with Windows, you can go through the menu structure here from the Start button. Or in the Katana search window, you could type in Visual Studio. That will pop up too. If you have an icon on the desktop, you can double click on that. And there's a lot of different ways of doing this. Okay. Which one of these worked and which one did not? I know this one is older, but I think this one, let's do, let's do this. Now, what we did the first day, or I didn't show you, but what you would do is you would create a new project. I showed you, no, we did do that, right? We did create a new project, C-sharp language, uh, target is Windows, desktop. Good. Now, once you have your solution, then you could probably find it in the recent ones or you could search for it or 
In Windows itself, you can just double click on the .sln file. The .sln is pointers to all those other files and all those subfolders. So well, I'm gonna run, let's open up this one here. I think it has what I need and I'll be able to tell in a moment. Now, mine is really squished and condensed here. First of all, I, I have the screen, res uh, screen size up, less desktop space, et cetera, but I think it just makes it easier for you to see out there, okay? So this is the code, and you can't see all of it. This is the code that we entered last time. How big is my... Um, pretty much got my real estate there. So here's the code we entered last time. Now, that's the form1.cs. So remember, that's the file we were trying to do. I also have this one open here. This is, this is additional stuff. We don't care about this file. This has a whole bunch of stuff in it. We'll talk about that stuff later. It's basically for the form itself. The code, the form itself is XML, and this is the code carrying that. Form1.cs, that's the event-driven code that we're interested in. And form1.cs bracket design, here is my actual form, my window form here. So last time we had value one, value two calculate. I added this little thing that I didn't do in class, simplistic program to add two numbers, not for assignments. This is not assignment zero. We're just getting ready for it. Whoa, and this is so slow. I'm waiting for my toolbox to come back. Uh, it's just, it's trying to load it. It's just really slow. Hopefully it'll load. We're gonna need that in just a little bit. All right, now, this is what we did last time. Once you have your form, and remember what we, we sketched the form out first, and then I double-clicked on Calculate. When I double-clicked on Calculate, it brought me to this method, button one click. That was a button, it's just by default named button one, button one click, and we added this code in it here. Come on. Let's move over so we can see the code. There it is. All right, excellent. And then what we were able to do is, I don't have to do this now because we did it before, but once you have things right, build, build menu of Visual Studio, select build. In the output window, it says build succeeded. Now, if it didn't succeed, and when you run yours, you'll have plenty of real estate space. So just have the output window open. I'm going to close it because it just takes it. See, there was an error to tell you here, et cetera. I'm just going to get rid of that because I can't see very much with it sitting there. After you've built it, debug is how to run it. But we're going to begin with start without debugging. Control F5, start without debugging. Here, brings up. Here's our form. So I can type in a number, two, three. I can click on calculate and then notice a little pop-up window appears, two plus three is five, good. Now, there are plenty of things wrong with this code. I know some of you are thinking about that. What if instead of an integer value, I typed in a real, a floating point value, two plus four plus two plus nine. You can see this, right? Because I'm sharing the entire window. Yes, hopefully you can see all this. Tell me if you can. Unhandled exception has occurred in your application. What is it? Well, what was going on here is we entered a real slash floating point value, exactly right. But rather than int, we should have cast our variable as double. All right, now, if I say continue, it will just get back here, but then we'll have trouble. Now, here's one thing uh, to think about. 
when a mistake like this happens, we're tempted to switch right back to studio and make changes. Don't do that without first exiting out of the running application. If you don't quit and shut down the running application, that's with the X in the window here, it's not going to, uh, your changes to your code are not gonna catch. Okay, good. Now, the code I'm gonna type in, you'll find on that sheet on Blackboard that says week one code snippets under day two updates. Our first update is to use double instead of int. Okay, so when we cast these, and now, yeah, people are telling me there's better ways of doing this, I know. Let's cast things as a double rather than as an int. And come on, I, I, I should turn off sense. Okay. So now what I've done is rather than, oh, I was, okay, let's do this. Okay, let's do this. Anybody see a potential issue here? Well, let's try and Don't see. You try to convert it to int 32. Exactly. And putting a double. Exactly. You could see this two, in, we're going to convert it to an int 32. Let's see what Visual Studio tells us. Now, why did it do that? This is going to be a runtime issue. Depending upon which way we go, well, let's try it and see. Start without debugging, okay? 2.3 times plus 2.9. On hand, yeah, okay. Well, this time, Let's quit the app, shut it down. And now rather than the method 2in32, guess what it is? It's to double. Yeah. Well, you do have to be able to spell. Ah. <laughs> Okay. There we go. Maybe. Hmm. How are we doing now? Are we okay? Build. Now remember, every time you make a change to the code, rebuild it. Build is compiling and it's doing some linking. Build succeeded. Let's see. Yep, thank you. Now let's run it again, debug. Start without debugging. 2.3, 2 2.9, 2 7.9. Aha, uh -huh. 5.2. Is that the real answer? Yeah. Okay, that works, good. Now, let's test it for, what about a negative value? Does that work? That works. What about a negative? Can I add a real and an integer? Okay, that works. As software engineers, remember I talked about a usable system? Sometimes users enter incorrect things into fields. Now, I didn't mean to type, I wanted to type 2.3, but I inadvertently had the shift key down. So I ended up typing that. I don't notice it, but I go ahead and calculate. Unhandled. This is called an OS abend. This error means we dropped to the operating system who caught the mistake. You don't want this to happen. You want to think ahead. All right, let's quit. So the next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna add error detection. There are a number of ways to do this. 
But the way that we're going to do it is with a try catch block. A number of languages have a try catch construct, including C sharp. Let me just add it to the code. Keyword try. Yes. I'm going to do this. And I'm going to get rid of that one because I'm going to indent these. Thankfully, it's not Python. Does that work? I don't even know. Okay. My command button is, oh, there we go. Too much. Okay. After the try construct, what the try construct says to do is give, give this a go. No problem. Give this a go. And if something goes wrong, rather than dropping dead to the operating system, I, hello, I can do something. So the second part of this is catch. Now, we'll ignore this for right now. We'll see, what, yeah, exception. Um, I don't care what I call it here, EX, fine. Yeah. And now we need a block. And within that block, we're going to do something. I'm going to use this message box, message box dot, oopsie, show. And within the message box, I'm just going to say error on input. Now we should have a better error message. And I'm going to call this warning. Let's put this down. There we go. Okay. So this try catch construct will say, try this. If something goes wrong, and I there's different ways to specify what might happen, then do this. It's just not dropping out to the operating system. I can control things and I can inform the user. Made a change. Let's build it. See what I see what I messed up. Build failed. Yep. Okay. What did I mess up? Let me go to the output window. I've got to get more. I got to get more real estate. How do I do that? Project configuration build configuration debug. Error. Ex oh, semi. Oh, oh. Okay, where did I forget? This? Yes, come on. Do, do, do. Try. How about? Are you going? Come on. Oh, for Pete's sakes. Okay. All right, let's. Oh, no, 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 no. Sorry, not there, dummy. No. How about here? Okay, how about that? Did I screw up anything else? Try, looks. Build. Build solution. One succeeded. Okay, that's better. Debug. Start without debugging. All right. 2.3, 2.9. Let's make sure that still works. It works. That's good. Now let's do our input bad thing. I'll just type the letter A there. Notice this. Now there'd be some ways that we can alert the user better. The user looks at this and says, oh, okay, good. I'll do that. Everything is good. Wunderbar. Now, yeah, I'm really slow. This pop-up box isn't really good. I mean, we really don't want to do that pop-up box. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to add, let's add a text box to the form here. 
and let's output the answer on a text box. So I've already designed my form. I can make changes later, no problem. I'll just put it over here. I should have a label that says answer. Matter of fact, let's do that really quickly. Label. Let's call that. So in the properties field under the text, we'll call it result. Resulty, good enough. Now I got a third text box. So let's, what rather than outputting to a message box here, what we're gonna do is we're going to output it to, I can get rid of all this, no, no reason to have a message box. Instead, I'm gonna put uh, my string here. Oh, shoot. I think on the notes I left out. Convert. Oh, no, no, no. Yeah, I could do that. I could do that. Good enough. So what I'm going to do here, I don't need this. And come on, come in. Ah, see what happens? Some things don't work. <laughs> Can you see that at all? Okay. I, I can't use my keyboard shortcuts to move across here. One of the disadvantages of certain virtual machines. Okay, so this dot. Now, what's the name of that text box? It's text box three. We could have looked that up, but just trust me on that. Come on. Come on. We're going to use the string method in conversion and we're going to send it answer i think it's called answer is it called answer no it's not called answer it's called sum why is it called answer there oh i changed everything Oop, why are there two of those uh-oh this dot text box three dot text Okay, what do you think? I should look at my code better. However, <clears throat> in the interest of time, let's try to build this. Build solution. Succeeded. Debug. Start without debugging. Okay, 2.3, 2 2.9, .9. well, 2.9, there it is. At this point, folks, you can review this and this will give you, I would encourage you just to do all these things, make all the changes, just don't screw up like I did. You know, you do it well, thank you. Um, this is not assignment zero. Take a look on Blackboard. There's a little document that says the running total idea resulted, yeah, I know. Uh, you do it better than me. I'm showing you the way not to do it. You do it better than me. And don't forget, when you're all done, be sure to close it down before you make changes. You don't have to do a file save all, you can, but every time you build it, things are saved. And then I will exit out of here. Good. Okay, folks, sorry, I hate to push up right against uh, the end of the period, but check on Blackboard, do assignment zero. Do the readings and be prepared for a quiz on Monday. Don't panic about any of this, but in addition, for those of you with a Mac, begin spending time. You don't have to do it on your own machine. You could do it in the lab machines at Irvine there. That's okay too. All right, folks, are there any uh, questions, comments, or concerns here at the very end? All right, I'm gonna stop the recording.